Good morning to the uh, morning workshop of the today and uh, our workshop today is thrombosis and hemostasis, snakes and ladders and coagulation testing. We have five eminent speakers today who are authority on the subject and uh, their CVs are available on the website so I would not uh, introduce all of them. They are Dr. Devashish Banerjee from Calcutta, Dr. Prasanna Kumar from Coimbatore, Dr. Mamta Soni from Chennai, Dr. Prantar Chakrabarti from Kolkata, and Dr. Ansi Abraham from Velour. Without much ado, I think we can start the session, get a lot of learning from them, and I'm sure we're going to have a lovely session. Good day. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasure to be here, and thank you, Manisha, for asking me to chair this session. Um, I think uh, this is one thing which we all face when we are uh, working in whatever setup we are. You always have people mixing up uh, investigations for coagulation and uh, for bleeding and investigations for thrombosis. So I'm so very glad that you put up this topic because they're diagonally opposite each other. Uh, the snakes and ladders of hemostasis and thrombosis, very aptly uh, said. Um, uh, without going into too much of details, let me introduce um, Dr. Debasis Banerjee, who's the first speaker of this morning, and he's going to talk on prolonged APTTs and how we approach them. He's the head of the hematology section at Trebedi and Roy Diagnostic Laboratories, Kolkata, and he's a consultant hematologist in Clinical Hematology Services Park Clinic. He's had his education at Kolkata, his MD from the Institute of Medical Sciences, Benares, um, and he's a visiting hematologist and professor at the Ramakrishna Mission Seva um, Pratishtam and Vivekananda Institute of Medical Sciences. I invite Dr. Debasis to be the first speaker in this session. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to thank Monisha and the team of Sismics for inviting me. So, uh, the interest in coagulation is uh, very low everywhere uh, in this country and I thought in Mumbai it would be a bit different but it is not so. I think the reason behind is the fact that people feel that coagulation is a difficult area, that's number one. And uh, number two, people do not develop these tests because they feel that probably they will not get enough cases to uh, uh, survive or to sustain these uh, tests. So these are the two reasons probably why we see less people interested in coagulation. But of course, I feel that coagulation is not so difficult and uh, it is much easier than many of the you know, difficult things we deal every day. My topic is uh, prolonged APTT, how do we approach it? We need three informations. First, whether this patient is bleeding or not. Secondly, whether PT is also prolonged or not. And third, can we correct this prolongation by mixing patient sample with an equal volume of normal plasma. And on the basis of this, we know we can divide the cases if we have both PT and APT prolonged and we can correct it by mixing with normal plasma, there will be a problem in the common part or there will be a problem at multiple levels. If only APT is prolonged and we can correct it, then we have deficiencies of factors in the intrinsic pathway, mostly factor 8, factor 9, rarely factor 11 also. If the patient is bleeding and it is not getting APT prolonged, if it is not getting corrected, then the patient is having an anticoagulant and most of that coagulant is against factor 8. Now if APT is prolonged, it is getting corrected and the patient is not having bleeding, then there is a problem in factor 12 or other surface acting factors. Rarely, factor 11 deficiency patients also might not have bleeding unless they get trauma or they are operated on. And finally, if a patient is not having bleeding but having thrombosis and we have a prolongation which is not getting corrected, we suspect lupus anticoagulant. This is how we proceed. But the first question is, is APTT really prolonged? 
this question comes when we get marginal prolongation of ability and most of the labs, small labs and medium sized labs, they do not use their own range naturally or establish their own reference range. Naturally, they use some of those uh, prescribed ranges and it varies and according to Tessie and Lewis it is 26 to 40 seconds. But there would be many patients with mild deficiency, especially factor 9 deficiency patients, minor, mild fact, uh, factor 9 deficiency patients, they can have slight prolongation of FGT. So also one would liberal in these patients. So one has to establish their, uh, their reference range for his laboratory. Otherwise, when epitity result is more than 40 seconds, there is not much a problem. But with the epitity values between 35 to 40 seconds, you will always remain in doubt whether it is really a prolongation or it is within the normal reference range. This is one, this is one, sorry, it's not moving. I think it's oh sorry. So this is a four days old male child whose APTT was found to be 38.3, and the laboratory said that the reference range is 22 to 30 seconds. So they asked for factor assay, and somebody did factor assay also, and found factor 8 to be 90.2 percent and 9 to be 39.1 percent with a reference range of 50 to 150. Now this is a problem with the reference range. If you go to the reference range for the children, for the uh, infant, for the new, newborn, uh, four days, the reference interval for APTT is 33 to 47.8 seconds. So to start with, the child had a normal APTT. And for uh, a four days old child, the reference range for factor 9 would be 36 to 66 percent if he is full term infant and 13 to 18 percent, 80 percent for healthy premature infant. So the reference range for the newborn is quite different from what we use for a normal adult person and this problem comes up when you are investigating a patient in the newborn period. So one has to understand that the reference range is very important to decide on for the investigation. So this is a guideline where you will find that the PT the PT uh, at first day or say day 5 is 12.4 to 1.46, APTT is 42.6 plus minus 8.62. So that is the kind of range and you can, uh, this is the British guideline uh, for the normal reference range. So one has to use the reference range. It is not possible to establish reference range for all the ages for everybody, but you can take this guideline. Now the other issue you have to take into account is the PCV of the sample. Samples having PCV more than 55 will have a prolongation of the PT or APTT. This is because the plasma is relatively low compared to the anticoagulant which you have used. So for those samples you have to adjust the citrate volume and again you have to draw uh, the sample. So if you find the APTT or PT is prolonged, please don't forget to check the sample and find out the PCV of the sample. Similarly, if the PCV is very low, you might get a lower result than what is expected. Now this is the basic uh, principle, whenever you get a prolongation, you do a mixing study with normal plasma as I have said and if it is getting corrected, it is factor deficiency, it is not getting corrected, it is anticoagulant, most commonly it is lupus anticoagulant. So you test for lupus anticoagulant, if that is negative, it is most likely a factor inhibitor and you investigate accordingly. So this is an example where you have a 102 seconds of APTT with a normal of 27.3 and it is getting corrected when you are mixing the sample after incubation. So we do two types of experiment. One is when we mix normal plasma and patient plasma and we incubate for two hours and also we incubate patient plasma and normal plasma separately and then mix at the end of two hours of incubation. Here both the results are normal so it is getting corrected so we know that there is a factor deficiency. Once we know that there is a factor deficiency, we would like to know which factor in the intrinsic pathway, most commonly 8 or 9. So what we can do, we can use aluminum hydroxide azoplasma, which is deficient in vitamin K dependent factors like 2790 and or we can use an AZ plasma which will be deficient in factor 5 and factor 8.
You can prepare this in your laboratory, it's not difficult. You have to keep plasma, sterile plasma for 48 to 72 hours and you have to check for PT. PT should be more than 90 seconds for the aged plasma. And when you mix, if you are getting a correction, if the prolonged APT is not getting corrected by aged plasma but is getting corrected by the alumina hydroxide adsorbed plasma, you know that there is a factor A deficiency. If it is reversed, if it is getting corrected by aged plasma but not getting corrected by alumina hydroxide adsorbed plasma, it is 9 deficiency. And if it is getting corrected by both, it is either 11 or 12. 12 does not bleed, so if there is bleeding, you can infer that there is 11 deficiency. This is another case where you have 102 seconds. So here we are using the deficient plasma. If these are commercially available, we can use factor 8 deficient plasma and we can also use factor 9 deficient plasma. So if the patient plasma is not getting corrected by 100 factor 8 deficient plasma but getting corrected by factor 9 deficient plasma, so we know that this patient has got a factor 9 deficiency. Now how do we do, once we know that there is a factor 8 deficiency or factor 9 deficiency, how do we do factor assay? Factor assay commonly is done by a one step method based on APTT. So same reagents which we use for APTT like an APTT reagent, of course this APTT reagent should not be a lupus 